Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to tonight's program, and thank you so much for being here. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Libraries, Center for Brooklyn History, and the Library's Arts and Culture team, BPL Presents. Tonight, I am really excited to welcome historian Martha Hodes for a conversation about her powerful new book, My Hijacking, A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering. My Hijacking is part history, part memoir. It tells the story of the 1970 hijackings by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the most elaborate hijacking event the world had ever seen. Martha, who was 12, and her 13-year-old sister, Catherine, were traveling unaccompanied on one of those flights. The book recounts Martha's personal experience as a hostage, but weaves into it the digging and detective work of the skilled historian. So the professional scholar and the 12-year-old girl meet. They come together to search for an understanding of what happened so many decades ago. It is a complicated and compelling story and a riveting read. Martha Hodes, welcome. Um, let me just say uh, a little bit about you. Uh, Martha Hodes is professor of history at NYU. She is an award-winning author of three earlier books, including most recently, Morning Lincoln. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Marcia, and it's so nice to be here. Before I jump in, uh, I wanted to share a few things for the audience. Um, first, I wanted to point out that we're putting in the chat a link to the book on the website of a local independent business here in Brooklyn, the community bookstore. So if you want to, you can purchase it from an independent shop. I also wanted to make sure you know that you have the option for closed captioning tonight. There's a button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, I, I want to invite you to share your questions tonight. Use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen, and I will take as many as there is time for towards the end of our talk. So this is such a unique convergence, Martha. It's so rare to have a trusted historian pull back the layers of a monumental moment in history in such a personal way. So let's start by setting the stage. What happened to you and Catherine in September, 1970? We were returning from visiting our mother in Israel. Our mother had gone to Israel to help. She was a modern dancer with the Martha Graham Dance Company and she had gone there to help set up Israel's um, first modern dance company, the Batsheba Dance Company. We were returning at the end of the summer to start seventh grade and ninth grade respectively. And our plane, TWA Trans World Airlines, um, our plane was one of five planes that were hijacked by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. I can say more about that group later, but I'll just say now that they were a um, Marxist-Leninist faction of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. Um, the night we landed, one other plane landed, a Swiss airplane. Um, a couple of days later, a third plane, a British plane landed. And two other planes were also hijacked, but one was foiled in midair. That was an El Al plane. And another, after all the um, passengers and crew were evacuated, was, um, was blown up on the tarmac in Cairo. So all in all, five planes, one that was foiled, four that were intercepted, and three that landed in the Jordan Desert with us. Amazing. Um, I, I want to um, delve in a little bit so you were there for six days and six nights okay. with about 150 passengers on your plane and about 10 um, airline staff, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, you may not actually remember yourself the conditions, so we can talk about that later. But I do want to find out what they were, <laughs> um, what, what you either do remember or you discovered as you did your research in terms of the, the, the place space details of being in the desert. Yeah, you're absolutely right that part of the book is trying to reconstruct so much of what I don't remember because my memories were very fragmented, but I did use my skills as a historian to reconstruct what the experience was like on the plane, and I can talk about how I did that. 
But I will just say for our listeners and viewers, um, it was very hot during the day. We were in the Jordan Desert. The temperature could reach 100 degrees. It was quite cold at night. The temperatures could plunge to freezing. Um, there was no air conditioning and no heating because there was no electricity um, left on the plane. The On that note, um, airplane bathrooms, airplane toilets flush via electricity. And as I said, there was no electricity. So the bathrooms were very unsanitary. And although I have no memory of the smell, I know from my research that it was quite atrocious and permeated the entire plane. People were also smoking throughout the plane. It was 1970. There was not a non-smoking plane. Um, we had food at the beginning and our captors supplied us with all the food they had and even gave us their own food, but food did run out. So although I have no memory of being hungry, um, we were hungry. I also have no memory of being thirsty, but we were thirsty. Um, the captors, our command, the commandos had brought a water truck out to the desert. They were well prepared, but there was limited water to go around, uh, sometimes just a half bottle filled uh, twice a day for three people in a row. So, um, the, and there was also, I should say, there were also sandstorms, um, very sudden uprisings of sand and dust that would fly into the airplane. Of course, all the exit doors were open and, uh, oh, it was just stifling. Um, and that happened twice during the week in the desert. So the conditions were difficult. They were very difficult. Um, and that is, that is very much part of the story I tell setting that scene. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you say, and you've mentioned a few times, you know, these, these are not things, these are not personal memories that you pull up from inside you. Although sometimes it is, um, there's this, a phenomenon that happens, I think, when you hear a story enough times about something that happened to you when you were little, it suddenly becomes a memory that you remember. But, um, but you know, but, but that, that you actually um, uh, told a narrative that um, uh, um, put aside the terror um, that there must have been, um, you know, and, I, and I'm very, very curious, you know, that kind of um, coping mechanism, and you know, for lack of a better term, um, plays a role. Why you chose to go there? after all these decades? Why seek out that fear? Why so compelled to get in touch with, with that? Why not leave the sleeping dog lie? Yeah, and let me just fill in a little bit for our audience, which is that um, when you said that I told the narrative that bypassed the terror, I think what you're referring to is, you know, I was an inveterate diary keeper at 12 years old and, and I had my diary with me on my plane and I wrote in it every day. And I saved my diaries. And so when I started this project, I thought, you know, my, my diary will be my trusted scaffolding. Um, historians prize and love sources that date from the time and place. The closer the source is to the time and place we're writing about, the better. So I thought, what could be better? I wrote in my diary every day on the plane. But then what I found, um, and I write about this early in the book, I found that I really had omitted quite a bit. And much of what I had omitted were were my emotions. And I must have been afraid. I had to have been afraid. And in fact, my sister remembers that I was afraid, but I never recorded that. So, um, and I, I told a kind of narrative that was, that was rather cheerful. And so then that leads into your question about why now and why go back. And so, um, you know, it was almost 50 years later. It did feel unresolved. Um, after I finished my last book, Morning Lincoln, which you mentioned, I decided um, that I was I, I was curious to find out more about what had happened because I was aware that my memories were very hazy and very fragmented. So I began to do some research only for myself. And then one day I was talking with my literary agent um, in her office and she asked me what I was up to. And I said, well, you know, I've been doing this research. I, I wasn't thinking about writing a book about the hijacking. And I, I had never told her about the hijacking and I told her about it and I was talking about it and telling her that, you know, I had found some interesting sources. And then the dog, her, her sweet golden doodle who was snoozing at her feet while we were talking, got up, patted across the room, put his paws, his front paws on my knees and looked up into my face. And I said to my agent, what's going on? And she said, oh, Farley can tell when someone's in distress. 
And that was a real clue for me because I did not know that I was in distress, just conversationally talking about this. And that was a clue that it was so unresolved. And also my agent thought it would be a wonderful book and was very, very encouraging. The last thing I'll say about that is, you know, um, and this pertains to, to any reader, to anybody, you don't have to have gone through as traumatic an experience, but, you know, things happen to us when we're children that our families don't always talk about and that we don't understand the significance of as children. And then when we're grown ups, we can go back and try to make sense of those events. I did that as a historian, but of course there are many ways to do that. You don't have to be a historian to do that. And that was also part of my purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to that actual history um, for a moment. What was the reality of the danger? Yeah, what that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what did you discover when you spent the hours in the archives, listening to the television news, reviewing State Department mm -hmm. telegrams, and so on? Yeah, so so that's a, a really good question. Um, you know, I had recalled, not incorrectly, that our captors had told us that our lives were not in danger, that they would not harm us. Now, it's important to understand that their mission as as hijackers, the, the mission of the Popular Front was to um, make public and make known the cause of Palestinian refugees who had been exiled from their homes in 1948 and again in 1967. And so they had to tell the world something different from what they told their captives. So there, there are a number of layers here. So in order for their mission to be successful and their purpose in, in holding hostages was not only to um, illuminate their cause to the world, but also they were um, attempting to engage in negotiations for the exchange of Palestinian prisoners, both in Israeli prisons and also in a number of European prisons um, for um, other um, hijackings and, and airport um, uh, crimes that they had taken place that had taken place. And so um, on the one hand, in order to have a successful mission, they had to tell the world that we are going to destroy the planes and all the passengers and crew on them if we don't get what we want by a certain deadline. At the same time, they told us we wouldn't be harmed, but it was a mixed message because we also knew there was a deadline. The first night we landed, I saw our captors wiring the plane with dynamite. So, you know, it was, and there were times when, although, although I will say that the commandos were very kind to the children, I learned during my research that, that they were, they also made very frightening statements to some of the other hostages. And so it was, it was kind of a mixed message. Um, one thing I do remember that was very interesting to me after I read the news coverage doing my research, when the hijacking was taking place in midair and one of the, the hijackers there was a man and a woman hijacker and the woman came over the loudspeaker and she said, um, we will be landing in a friendly country with friendly people. Now, I remembered that, but um, historians, you know, historians love when a memory is corroborated. And I would say every single person I talked to remembered that phrase, friendly people, friendly country. And so, um, again, you know, what the information that our captors disseminated was contradictory. Um, but I will also say that no, none of the hostages died or were harmed in any way. The only death was one of the hijackers on the foiled LL plane, the foiled hijacking of the LL plane. So they told us no one be, would be harmed and they did, from our point of view, they did keep their word. Mm -hmm. So you call them commandos, mm -hmm. um, not terrorists. And you talked a little bit about um, you know, their mission the Popular Front's mission, um, what they were what they were attempting to communicate to the world um, that uh, turned a blind eye largely to their plight. How did the commandos treat you? What, did, what was your sense of them as people? Um, so let me just first say about the terrorist commando language. Um, that was intentional. I'm a historian. The word terrorism and the, the definition of terrorists has changed across time. Um, 
in the 1970s, it was shifting from state actors to non-state actors, um, a sense of people with a cause to irrational savagery, a kind of conception of irrational savagery. I was really interested to find that the most of the news um, reports on our hijacking did not use the word terrorist. And so I was trying to be true to the historical moment. Um, and of course, you know, the, the popular front would have a different definition of terrorism than people who were on the other side. Um, you asked about the commandos, our captors. They were, they were nice, very nice to the children. Um, and that was my main memory of them. So one of my one of my main memories was, you know, they let the hostages out of the plane onto the desert floor every so often for exercise and light and air. And one of my main memories was um, one of the commandos, you know, wearing his big heavy military boots and belt full of weapons, jumping in and jumping rope with the children and the hostages um, clapping and laughing. And um, I had another memory and, and I verified this with my sister. Um, at one point, you know, she was crying, you know, a moment when she was probably thinking about home, our mother, our father and feeling afraid. And she was sitting in the seat, wiping away tears. And one of the commandos came by and said to her, don't cry, we have children too. And that felt fatherly and we missed our father. Um, there was another moment, just to give a last example, where my sister, um, she also kept a notebook and she had her spiral notebook on her tray table. And she had drawn a heart on the back of it and, and put in the name of the Israeli boy she liked that summer. And one of the commandos came down the aisle and took a look at the heart and said to her romantic, you know, and smiled. And so we had, we had no issue understanding them as fully human. And so we were, we were interested in the stories they told, you know, many of them had been children when their families were exiled. And we also had grown up in a non-religious, very secular household, and we hadn't gone to Hebrew school. And we didn't have the kinds of narratives that other American Jews in 1970 who went to Israel. And of course, this was three years after the 67 war and many American Jews went to walk to the newly um, occupied territories to see um, many of the sacred cities on the West Bank. That wasn't our experience. You know, our, our mother was there because she was a dancer. And so we were um, curious about stories we didn't know because we, we didn't, like many American Jews, we were like many American Jews in 1970 in not knowing it's amazing to think about it now, but not even knowing that Palestinians had once lived on the land called Israel. And so that was interesting to us. That was um, that was troubling to us. And we we felt sorry for the hostages and we felt sorry for the commandos. And we couldn't, you know, we were 12 and 13, but we we couldn't think about a, we couldn't think of a solution. We couldn't think of a way to make everything okay for everybody. Mm -hmm. I love the term you use in the book, ir irreconcilable narratives. Mm -hmm. Right, very much. And, and that's one of the things I began to learn That's that fall at 12 years old, that, that the narratives, the historical narratives, and then of course I made sense of this when I put this together as a historian all these years later, um, the two sides tell narratives that are so different and, and irreconcilable. And of course, you know, in an ideal world, there would be a lot of nuance and complexity and, and empathy, but um, we couldn't make it happen then as children. And it hasn't happened so far yet either. I want to, I want to find out a little bit about um, the, the process that you went through. How long did it take you? How long were you researching and writing from you know that that moment in your in your agent's office to you know finishing the, the manuscript? How long was that? I'd say about um, seven or eight years, which is about how long I take to write each of my books. So this was about the same. I did a lot of research. A lot of it was going to archives. So I went to the TWA archives. I went to the archives of the International Red Cross. They were um, permitted to come out to the desert for health reasons and to serve as intermediaries. And their archives are in Geneva, Switzerland. I went there. I went to the Nixon Presidential Library, which is in California, because Nixon was president. And I read all kinds of interesting telegrams between Nixon and Kissinger and um, uh, transcriptions of telephone conversations where, you know, Nixon would say, hi, Henry, what's going on with the hostages? You know, it was, they were direct transcriptions of these very uh, casual conversations that were quite fascinating. I read the State Department archives uh, in Washington, D.C. 
full of telegrams and and you know the telegrams are very interesting it, in relation to your last question marcia because people did think that that there was a good chance that we would not survive and so it was it was quite um intense to read the state department telegrams um pondering the death of of the hostages um and you know anyway and i and of course i read i deeply read in the popular fronts literature their archives are online and in english and i read their from 1970 and earlier i read their position papers and their statements and of course many interviews um with some of the people who were on our plane um so that was also very important to me and of course a lot of research in newspapers um and again, this is this is the historian who wants sources close to the time and place. So if hostages were interviewed as soon as they got home, those were, were really precious because closest to memory, obviously. And then watching the nightly news, um, every single broadcast that my father would have watched in New York, reading the Jerusalem Post, the English language newspaper, which is where my mother got her news, and on and on and on. I mean, it strikes me that um, you know, you are a historian of. 19th century history, largely, you know, um, there were no broadcasts to, to watch back then. Um, uh, and I, I guess I, I, I'm curious about what you remember as you uncovered these things. I and mean, was it, did it, did it feel tangibly kind of different to you to be doing this kind of work? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, as a 19th century historian, I was used to reading handwritten diaries and letters. I'm quite proficient at reading 19th century handwriting. Um, nothing was typed. And here I had all of these typed documents. So that was lovely. Certainly not broadcast media. That was really interesting to me because one of the things you don't have as a 19th century historian, you usually don't have likenesses or images of the people you're writing about unless they were well to do enough to have commissioned a portrait. Um, of course, there was photography in the Civil War. And I do study the Civil War era, but it was very staged um, because there you couldn't take a picture of something that was in motion. And so now I had nightly news broadcasts and I also had I had not just the broadcast but the footage that the reporters had taken that was unedited, which I found in the National Archives. It was had been preserved by the CIA and I found it in something called the Motion Picture Research Room in Washington DC National Archives. So I saw on screen, you know, when hostages were released, I saw my fellow hostages, I saw the commandos, um, I saw our crew members, the captain, the co-pilot, what we called in those days, the stewardesses. And in one instance, I, I came across, and this is in the book, an image of my sister and me when we were being released. And that was really fascinating, partly because, you know, the book is so much about trying to recapture the experience that at that point when I saw us on the screen, it almost felt the way a historian feels when she comes upon really wonderful, beautiful evidence of the person she's writing about, but it didn't quite feel like myself. And I, I will leave this as a gift to the reader, but toward the end of the book, I do come across evidence that finally makes me feel like, yes, I was really there. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> The word that comes to my mind in imagining you um, laying out this story through all of this deep, deep research on the one hand, and also being sequestered, sequestered from any of that in your experience as a hostage, um, the word that comes to my mind is surreal. Mm -hmm. You know, that did it, you know, feel incredibly surreal to um uh to put in place the history in such detail and imagine what the experience must have been like for your loved ones yes very much so i think um i hinted at this at the response to in, to your last question but you just said it really well a lot of what i was was um faced with writing the book was this sense that i hadn't really been there and of course, you know, my name and my sister's name, our names were on the passenger lists. And yet I still felt this remove, even when I saw that image of us on the screen until, you know, the accumulation of working on the book finally made me feel like I was there. But one of the parts that was maybe most difficult to research was recreating the experience that my parents had gone through. Um, 
my parents, my father just died last March. So, you know, they were alive through the writing of the book. My mother is still alive. She's in her 90s. My mother's memories were very, very hazy. And my father um, claimed to have vivid, have vivid memories, but, you know, he did what a lot of people do in that kind of traumatic situation. He he boiled his experience down to a number of scripts, a number of stories that he would tell over and over again when I asked him about the hijacking. And they were usually the kinds of stories that, and I, I don't say this with any judgment, but, you know, stories that would make it tolerable for him. So just to give one example, he would always tell the story that when he came to pick us up at Kennedy Airport, when we finally got home, of course, we ran into his arms. And my sister apparently said, oh, dad, we were so worried about you. And he would tell that story over and over again, I think because it made him feel that if we had worried about him, maybe we weren't so afraid or so worried for ourselves. And there were a number of stories like that. And so in a way, my parents themselves were not a big help in trying to recreate their experiences. And so, as I mentioned before, I watched the news reports. I read the newspapers they read. I also talked to neighbors and friends and asked what they remembered. And in that way, I was able to recreate what that week was like for them. And, and I believe it may even have been worse than it was for us because we did have some reassurance and they saw only the message that the hostages and planes may be destroyed and all of those lives lost, including that of their children. Yeah, I think that, um, I think that it's, 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 um, courageous, if I could use that word, to have um, gone down this path that you decided to go down and, and do this research and tell this story. Um, and I'm wondering whether there were ever uh, particular moments, um, I don't want to, you know, aha moments or moments of shock, moments of, you know, penetration to wow your core as you were going through you know the files and the boxes and the video and so on and so forth um were there was there any moment that sort of or moments that stood out as uh you know bingo oh my goodness or you know I, I, that got me yeah that's so interesting because as a historian, I'm I'm interested in multivocal stories and all the layers and nuances. And so if there was such a moment, um, it was usually tempered by other kinds of evidence. So, for example, you know, reading State Department telegrams or conversation transcriptions between Nixon and Kissinger, in which they are seriously discussing our possible death, was very intense and very emotional. But then I also knew from my research and from my memories and being there that that, that was part of the story um, that ha it had to be part of the story, as I said before, because of the mission of the Popular Front, but that there I knew from other parts of my research that the Popular Front's internal policy was never to harm anybody. And so um, there was something very visceral and very intense. And I think that intensity came from what I was just talking about, about recreating my parents' experience. But as the historian and as the researcher, I usually had um, one particular kind of event or kind of moment. I will say that, you know, when I saw my sister and me on the screen, that was, um, it was news footage of the van that drove the hostages. There, were, there was a line of vans, a caravan that drove the hostages from the desert into the capital of Jordan, Amman, to the Intercontinental Hotel, which is where we were released. And there was a civil war going on in Jordan at the time between Palestinian insurgents and the Jordanian army. So it, although we were driven to a hotel and it was a, a, a luxury hotel, it was the glass was broken. It was filled with bullet holes. It was, you know, almost no guests were there except for the press. Um, and recreating that experience through um, reading not just the newspaper reports, but some of the personal writings of the reporters and, you know, reading the PFLP accounts, that was that was quite something to me because honest, Marsha, I didn't remember. I mean, I knew there was a war going on because we spent one night in Amman and we were told to get down on the floor if we heard shooting and we did hear shooting. Um, 
but I did not have any memory of the hotel as being shot up and, and a target in this war. It was, it was actually a, a, a place of, of conflict. You know, the fighting was going on between the two sides at the hotel. I had remembered the hotel as this absolutely beautiful place, which maybe to me as 12 years old, and you know, there was all this food laid out and we were told we could have whatever we wanted. I mean, it obviously was a beautiful place, but it was really amazing to me to read about being released into this, this war going on in the city of Amman, which I hadn't registered in the, in the intensity that I was now reading about it and researching. Mm -hmm. I will say um, that the place in the book where that brought tears to my eyes was when you went back to that hotel. Um, I don't want to ruin it for people who are going to read the book, um, but it, it, it was um, very powerful to read. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, and I won't, I won't give away anything either, but one of the things I did do in the book was I returned to many of the places. I returned to not only my mother's apartment in Tel Aviv, but also to the desert, the Jordan Desert, and um, to the Intercontinental Hotel, and then also to the smaller hotel where my sister and I spent the night. And I even went back to the TWA terminal at Kennedy Airport where we had come home and been released. And that terminal had just reopened. It has just reopened, not, not as a working terminal, but as something called the TWA Hotel and Museum. And uh, just when I was finishing the book, um, it, it wasn't quite open yet, but I got a private tour by a very sympathetic and lovely person who understood my project. And so visiting these places, and especially, you're right, Marcia, visiting the Intercontinental was the place, and I write about this in the book, that was the most, um, kind of the most visceral flashback experience I had in the process of writing the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you talk about, speaking about flashbacks, flash bulb memories. Um, I wonder if you could describe that a little bit. Yeah, so flashbulb memories are, you know, memories, um, like still pictures that I'm sure everybody has them, that come into your mind, and um, it's a kind of a, a snapshot of something that happened um, that you remember forever. Now, um, I read a lot about memory and the way memory works, and flashbulb memories are not always accurate. One of my flashbulb memories was um, when we were up in the air and the hijacking was taking place, the co-pilot came out of the cockpit with his hands up and a gun held to his neck. And I had always remembered that and always had that image. It was my flashbulb memory. Um, while I was researching and speaking to fellow hostages, I found that nobody else had that memory and I began to doubt it. Um, and, you know, I do write about this in the book, but it, it won't give anything away to say it took me uh, several years to find the co-pilot to locate him. Um, when I did, he was in his 80s and living in England, uh, loveliest man in the world, which is how I remember him. And he and I corresponded for a long time. And I asked him about this memory and he he clarified it for me. It did actually happen, but it was an absolute split second where he was walking from the cockpit to one of the lavatories and the, one of the hijackers allowed him to do so, but, you know, with his hands up and a gun at his neck. And it was, you know, it was probably less than one second. And I happened to be looking up and I happened to see that. So he did confirm that memory for me. And that was very powerful to be in touch with him about that. I think it's also important to contextualize the 70s, um, you know, as a time when Things weren't talked about like they are now, you know, the term trigger warning didn't exist, um, you know, and so there was a sort of gestalt of, uh, you know, we'll just continue on as if nothing happened. Um, uh, and, and, you know, you're, you know, you're, I'm sure you have an opinion, but it's, it's not something that, uh, you know, you're not a you're not a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist about whether way things are today are better or worse for our sense of adjustment and you know well being and so on and so forth. But um, but I think it's important to uh, call that out as one of the things that steered you to. Yes. Being in a position where you were going to really 
dig this story out for yeah. yourself. So one of the things that I didn't know, although other people may know this, was, was PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, was not named until 1980. That's 10 years after we got back. Now, I should say that reading about these kinds of um, syndromes and conditions, my sister and I would not, in fact, have been diagnosed with PTSD, although some of the hostages were. We suffered what would now be called acute stress disorder, which is much more limited. But you are correct that the the general wisdom was it will only make it worse to talk about it more. Now, not all families abided by that. There were, you know, I spoke with many of the people, the former hostages I spoke with were people who were also children at the time because I remembered them. They had been my friends on the plane. Some of their families did talk about the hijacking and made a point of it, but the majority did not. Um, the majority did what my father did, which is um, don't bring it up, you're home, everything's fine. I was amazed. You know, my father had to go to our schools and tell the principal, my children won't be at the first day of school because they're on those hijacked planes. And so I was amazed in talking to my seventh grade friends to learn that when the teachers called my name, you know, in seventh grade, you move from class to class, um, from subject to subject, and the teachers would call my name and the teachers did not know that I was on that plane. And so my best friend, and I write about this in the book and I, I talked to her quite a bit about it. She had to say when my name was called, you know, Martha's on one of those planes. And of course she didn't know if I was, she couldn't say, oh, she'll be back next week. And so um, it's not just the hostages, but, you know, I think these days the classmates would also have had the option of some sort of counseling, but my friends had no, nothing. I mean, they were the ones informing the teachers. And I think that was, quite difficult for them. What, what I found was that I, in the, from their memories, and this was very valuable in writing the book, they remembered that I, I didn't want to talk about it. They wanted to know what it was like. And I, I was quite dismissive of it. Um, in the words of one of my seventh grade friends, she said, uh, no harm done, no lasting effect. That was her impression all these years until I talked to her about writing the book. And I think for me, it was about trying to prove the insignificance of the event because I didn't want to think about it. I did want to act as if it didn't matter, but that wasn't true. It did matter. And it took me all these years to go back and find out. Yeah, so that's that, that sort of leads me right to my question I'm curious about is how it did affect you having had this experience. Um, you know, what Martha Hodes would be like if she had not been a hostage for six days and six nights in the Jordan Desert. You know, how did it affect the path that you chose in life and the choices that you've made and where you are today? And if you can articulate that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's something a lot of people have asked me about. I mean, I will say just on a kind of um, concrete level, um, although I do fly quite frequently, a lot of it professionally, um, you know, I do, I do still have kind of visceral responses to airports and, and certain parts of, of airplane trips, for some reason, landing can be very hard for me. So I do, and even after writing the book, <laughs> that hasn't been cured. Um, I just took my first overseas flight since the pandemic, and I found that that was the same. Um, but in terms of my, my path in life, I, you know, a lot of people ask me, did you become a historian because of the hijacking? And I haven't thought of that, but I think there might be some truth in that. You know, I, I spent my career as a historian writing about other people's lives. Um, and in a general sense, you know, the Morning Lincoln book is certainly, uh, certainly fits this pattern, grief, loss of various, in various ways, um, people's experiences that were, were quite traumatic. Um, and I, I think that it, there's a chance that I did that because I wasn't thinking about, I didn't want to think about my own trauma, but that I was drawn to those kinds of experiences of people in the past. Um, I also will say that in college, I studied comparative religion and I also got a master's degree in comparative religion. So it was kind of a, um, you know, for someone who grew up in a, in a very atheist secular household, it was kind of a, an intellectual reckoning with the divine and then, um, and world religious systems. And then of course I made a switch to history because I wanted to write about people's lives, not just about abstract thought and philosophy. And I'll just add one more point here, which is, um, and this is my analysis, not my sister's, but, you know, she first became an actress and my sister was the one member of our family who wanted to talk about the hijacking and my father and I were more keen to remain silent. And so in some ways, I've wondered if my sister became an actress so she could be on a stage and, and talking to an audience of rap listeners. And then after she became an actress, she switched to become a social worker. She works with victims of domestic violence. And 
again, this is my analysis, not hers, but in my mind, you know, it's a way of, of not turning away from, from the terrible things that happen, um, that happen inside families. And so I commend her for those choices. Um, whether or not it was related to the hijacking, I can't say for sure, but there seemed, there seemed to be a connection there in my mind and heart. Yes, and it's beautiful the way that the book is infused with appreciation for your sister and the role she played in being an older sister, although just by a year or so, um, to protect you um, and perhaps, you know, emote for you a little bit, um, you know, that that you dedicated to her, you thank her, uh, you know, at the end and um, and she's she's it, it, it's um, it's it's a wonderful story of uh, sisterhood as well. Well, I'd like to just say one thing about that. Um, you know, she was my, she was absolutely my hero. She kept us safe. She made sure we weren't separated. She answered all the commandos questions. She talked to the press when we were released. But, you know, um, one of the things that I discovered in talking to her was just to call her a hero in a way doesn't do justice to her own experience. She was a child too, and she didn't have someone to shield her. So in a way it was more traumatic for her. And so, um, you know, she insists, and I, I understand her point, you know, she did what any older sibling would have done. To me, it was heroic, but, you know, to her, it was a natural act. And I also want to make sure not to um, diminish her own experience of this event, which was, which was very difficult as the, as the older sibling. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to um, remind everybody that um, you can, put your own questions into the Q&A and in a minute I'm, I'm going to start to go to them but I just have you know one one more question before I do that how does it feel to have this book now out in the world that's a that's a lovely question Marcia thank you um you know it, it feels good in a lot of ways um as I mentioned or you mentioned perhaps I've written three other books and those books were the work of historian um you know, when you write a work of history and it's reviewed, you know, you worry, will people be convinced by my argument? Um, did I interpret my evidence correctly? You know, and those things matter a great deal. But, you know, writing a book that was much more of a memoir was a different experience in terms of, of reviews, because um, if people have criticisms, I, I felt much more um, sympathetic to those criticisms just because they're readers and readers respond to different things in different ways. and. Um, you know, I had one experience where a reader um, wasn't very, um, wasn't satisfied or didn't enjoy the parts of the book where I go back, you know, where I go back to Jordan and go back to Israel. That was one of my favorite parts of the book, but that's okay because different readers respond to different things. And so it's a really different experience um, than having a book out there in the world that's kind of, you know, that's your professional work and that um, you're judged by professionally. On another level, you know, of course, um, believe it or not, I'm a very private person. And so having my own story out there, and I should say my editor, who was so wonderful, but you know, he he had to work with me a lot to to kind of get me to open up more. And so that's hard. Um, that's hard. But you know, once a book is published, it's out there in the world. And it really, it feels like you can let go. And I've been feeling perfectly fine about letting go. Yeah, wonderful. So I'm going to go through some of the questions here. Here's, here's John who um, is asking about the history. He asks, were both the 1948 and 1967 refugees forced out or did they leave on their own? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because that's part of the irreconcilable narratives. Um, one side tells one story and one side tells another. Um, you know, obviously people may disagree. I, I did an incredible amount of reading about Israel-Palestine. Um, in 1948, Palestinians were either forced to leave their homes, exiled, or were encouraged to do so, or had no choice to do so. Um, that is my reading of the historical documents. And there are Israeli historians, um, often called the new historians, who have backed up that narrative with an incredible amount of documentation. Um, and then after the, I'll just say after the 1948 war, the West Bank then belonged to Jordan and many Palestinian refugees settled on the West Bank. 
And then after the 1967 war, when Israel occupied the West Bank, those same refugees were then um, again forced to leave their homes. Um, and those were our, our captors. Um, the PFLP, many of them had been children during the 48 war and had memories and had written, written memories, written down memories of their families being forced to leave, um, either you know, being told to leave um, by the Israeli army or um, being forced to leave because of the violence around them. Um, so, you know, as I said, and I'll just say again, as children, my sister and I felt sorry for the hostages. There were a number of Holocaust victims on the plane. We felt terribly sorry for them. Um, and we also felt sorry learning about the stories of our captors. And so um, in a way that empathy was, you know, for both sides was very innocent, but maybe there's something, maybe there's something to that we can all learn. Mm -hmm. Diane, who has, I believe, read the book, writes that you mentioned that you were given sedatives and sleep aids yeah. at, at the, during your time in the desert. Um, and she's curious, where would these drugs have come from, whether there was enough for all the passengers? And of course, would this help explain your, your spotty memory? Yes. So um, thanks for bringing that up, Diane. Um, you know, 1970 was the age of Valium. Um, this kind of medication was dispensed very freely. Um, where it came from on the plane, um, there were two doctors on the plane. The PFLP brought their own doctor onto the plane to make sure that um, if, if any hostages suffered and hostages did suffer from all kinds of ailments, you know, whether it was fly bites or, you know, infected eyes or, um, you know, a cigarette burn. Um, and the doctor, the Palestinian doctor was somebody, um, this was another kind of co um, corroborative memory. Every hostage I spoke to remembered him as such a nice man with twinkling eyes. He had these tranquilizers and the International Red Cross also sent a doctor um, and that doctor camped out in the desert in tent and he also had tranquilizers. Um, they were all dispensed quite freely, not just on our plane, but on the other planes as well. Um, one of the stewards on the Swiss airplane was nicknamed Sleeping Pill Mike because he gave out these pills so freely. Often they were given to the women, and partly that was because many of the men were eventually removed from the plane and brought, brought elsewhere. And um, some of the women who were the wives or daughters or sisters of those men were, were quite distraught. But you know, they also they also gave tranquilizers to the children. Um, and there were some people who refused to take them. And some of the memories that I read about these sedatives were quite fascinating. You know, one one young woman remembering that her mother was just in a stupor the entire week. So um I do write about this in the book that I do think this is related to my at one point in the book, I think I say it's it's a miracle I remembered anything. Um, my sense is that we were given those pills at night. And at night is also when our captors would interrogate certain um, hostages in order to determine their ties to the state of Israel, in order to determine their value as exchanged hostages for Palestinian prisoners. And so we did not know. We slept through all of that, even though we were at the in the front of, um, of what was called tourist class, um, right near the first class area where these interrogations were going on. So yes, this played. Um, a vexing and important role, and I do write about that in the book. Mm -hmm. Anna, Anna asked something that I'm actually also very curious about. Um, does this change how you will look as a historian at diaries and letters going forward? Yeah, great question too, thank you. So, you know, his, look, historians know that the sources we use are not mirror images of what happened. That is the absolute number one rule of interpreting sources. And you know, I, I can give you a, a, a very vivid example from the book I wrote about responses to Lincoln's assassination. I read so many reminiscences in which people claimed to have carried Lincoln's body out of Ford's theater across the street to the boarding house where he eventually died. So many people said they carried Lincoln out of the theater, not enough, I mean, that number of people would not have fit around even Lincoln's six foot tall frame, it, it just wouldn't have been possible. I mean, you know, 50, 100 people claim to do that. Now, it's not that those people were lying, but, you know, maybe they followed the people who were carrying the president's body. They were nearby and then they remembered that they were there. So, so we know, we know that sources are not reliable. Um, 
in a, in a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence. I think what was so interesting to me was to have such a direct source. You know, I had written this diary on the plane every day and to see what I had omitted from it was so stark and so vivid. One of the things I ask my students when I'm working with undergraduates or graduates who are you know, working with primary sources and writing history, I say to them, why did this person tell this story this way? And that was a question I had to ask myself. Why did I tell this story this way in my diary? And, you know, I came to the answer writing the book, and it won't give anything away to say, you know, I was crafting a story that I could live with, a story that I felt my parents could live with. Um, my parents would never read my diary, but it was a way of making it into something that I could tolerate, something that I could um, I could tell if I were ever going to talk about it. I wanted it to be a cheerful story because I couldn't I couldn't absorb everything that had happened. It was too much. There were moments when you were writing about what you had written in your diary that really made me chuckle. You know, things like I wrote, gosh. You know? Yeah, exactly. I did. It was very, very, I was sort of, you know, at 12, I was like just on the cusp of becoming a surly teenager. And I was still like this innocent little girl. And so, and I write about this in, in the book as well. My next summer's diary when I'm 13, I've really made the switch to this kind of sarcastic, you know, wise cracking kid. But at 12, I was still writing things like, gosh, you know, they blew up the planes, gosh. And so it was, it was somewhat endearing for me to see that girl, you know, that girl who was both me and not me at the moment. Don has another question about history, um, and this is a good one to, to ask. How was this hijacking ultimately resolved? Yeah, um, that's also a very good question. So um, although a number of the hostages, a, a little bit over 50 of the hostages, were kept for two weeks longer, and that was a whole different experience, um, all the hostages did come home by the end of September. Um, everybody was released. Um, the only concession made to the Popular Front was that um, I think seven Palestinian prisoners in European jails were released. Um, and that, as I said before, that was for um, airport attacks in Switzerland and West Germany, I believe. And um, the hijacker of the El Al plane, famous Palestinian activist to this day, Leila Khaled, she had been um, imprisoned in Great Britain and she was released as part of the exchange. Um, there had been a war in Jordan, but. King Hussein remained in power. The um, Popular Front and the Palestinian insurgents, although they did well militarily at first, they did ultimately lose that war. And that's one of the reasons they released the last 50 hostages. They were, they were simply losing the war. Um, the Popular Front, you know, two things happened. On the one hand, there was a, a worldwide condem condemnation of hijacking and the taking of civilians as hostages. And that, by the way, that condemnation included most other members of the Palestine Liberation Organization who didn't believe in the strategy of hijacking. Um, but at the same time, there was a worldwide illumination and recognition of the Palestinian cause. I, I came across just on that point, a, a really interesting um, memoir by a Palestinian, no, about all kinds of other Palestinian writer, all kinds of other, um, the book was about many things, but there was there were a few lines about this hijacking. And, and this person said, this writer said, you know, even though I didn't support the hijacking, it was it was becoming clear to me that the cause of Palestinian refugees and exiles was becoming much more well known in the world. So so really um, mixed result for um, for the popular front and, um, you know, an organization that has since struggled in many ways, um, although I sh should say the Popular Front several years later did themselves also renounce hijacking as a strategy. Complicated history. Mm -hmm. To um, just circle back to something that you said earlier, because I, I didn't get a chance to follow up. You, you, you said that you'd done a lot of thinking um, and reading about memory. Um, and I am curious what you discovered and what your takeaways are about memory. Yeah, um, you know, memory is is a, a vexing source for historians um, for all of the reasons that we have talked about, Marsha. People craft their memories. When they record those memories, they're crafted in particular ways, whether it's a diary or a letter or a recording. Um, you know, what was so fascinating to me is in a way, and this is in the title of the book, which is the, the subtitle is A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering. The forgetting part was very, very interesting to me. Um, 
you know, once, so I, when I started the book and I do this in the beginning of the book, I wrote down everything I could remember, which wasn't much. So that's the opening of the book. And then as I began to research, this was also really interesting to me. And I learned this by reading about memory. I would come across things I hadn't remembered. And then part of my mind would say, oh yeah, I remember that. But actually there's no way to really know if that's a real memory or it's a suggested memory. And so, I mean, some things I think I really did remember, but it was very interesting to me to realize that I couldn't actually tell the difference. Um, some of what I read, you know, I read a lot of articles in psychology journals, but I also read, um, I also read other people's experiences with trying to remember childhood events that had happened and, and how they, you know, something they had remembered that turned out not to be true and then how they dealt with that. So I, I read both personal accounts and I guess you could say mm, social science accounts and tried to put that together. It's, it's quite, um, quite fascinating. And in a way there aren't, um, there aren't, as direct answers as I would have liked. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. We are um, running out of time, which is amazing to me. Um, I, I, I'd like to just end with a, a question about what your hope is for uh, what you want for people to take away from, from this book. Yeah, thanks so much for asking that. I had mentioned this before, and I'll say it again, maybe in a different way. You know, the book in many ways is about something traumatic that happened to me as a child. And I have to say, I'm using the word traumatic in a colloquial, not necessarily a, a, a scientific or, or psychiatric way. And I think there's a real value in using that word in a colloquial conversational way. Um, I hope that readers will take from the book. Um, the possibility of returning to events from our past and specifically our childhoods that we didn't have a chance to consider um, as adults, as grownups. You don't have to be a historian. I think I said that before. There are many ways to go back and think about things that happened to you. Um, I hope that readers will take that away from the book. And I also hope, you know, it's so interesting. The book is very much about the historical context in which this hijacking happened. And I hope that that history will be important to readers. I very much hope that. Um, I, I also, in many ways, feel that the book is, it's about that history. The book is also very much about my family and my experience with the, my family going through what we went through. And so I hope that readers can take both of those things from the book, both the specifics and then a kind of more, um, a, a larger complex of possibilities for thinking about our own childhoods, the things that people didn't want to talk about, the things maybe that we didn't want to talk about, that maybe as grownups, we can go back and think about in, in ways that are healing, helpful, um, in, in ways that aren't always predictable. So beautifully said, Martha. Um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, uh, my hijacking, here it is. I love the title, A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering. Um, we'll put in the chat again, the link to the community bookstore. And I want to let everybody know that this will, this has been recorded and the, the, the um, conversation will go on to the Center for Brooklyn History's YouTube channel. Um, but mostly I want to congratulate you again, Martha, for, um, you know, this extraordinary triumph. It's on so many levels. Um, it's it's uh, on a personal level, as a historian, um, telling various narratives. And we talked about narratives that you bring together um, in, in a way that I found a page turner. So congratulations. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And on that note, I, I wish everybody uh, a nice- I just nice... say, Marcia, thank you so much for your very thoughtful uh, questions. And I really appreciate everybody who tuned in this evening and will tune in later. Thank you also. It was a joy. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs>